Hi guys and welcome back. In today's video we're going to talk all about balancing hormones naturally and holistically. We're going to take a deep dive into the four things, that is eight, four things that you need to think about when you're working on any hormone. This could be applicable to estrogen dominance, PCOS, infertility, thyroid hormone metabolism, insulin, cortisol, you name it, if it's a hormone, this is going to be applicable. And of course, hormones affect the gut. So that's why we're talking about it. Let's get right into this. And let's start with the first letter of this four part acronym. You can see that I'm using the acronym PTSD. Don't worry, we're not talking about trauma and anxiety again. We'll talk about that more on the IBS Freedom Podcast. But in this case, the P in this acronym for hormone balancing stands for production and this marker is dead. So we will use a different one. All right, production. So really the question to start out with is, is the gland producing the thing that you want it to produce? And it sounds easy, but it does have a couple of moving pieces to it. So A, do you have the proper nutrition? Do you have the cofactors and the backbones and the building blocks to make that hormone? So all hormones are made out of protein and dietary protein is absolutely essential to making any sort of hormone. So if it's the case of the thyroid, you need tyrosine. If it's other bigger hormones, you might need all sorts of different amino acids, but you need dietary protein to actually make the hormone itself. And most frequently you need numerous vitamins and minerals in order to act as cofactors so that enzymes work appropriately and they can slap things together for you. So for example, iodine is very, very famously needed for thyroid production because it's actually a structural component of the thyroid hormone. You also need things like zinc and iron to make thyroid hormone. You need B vitamins. You need a lot of different nutritional cofactors to run your enzymes in order to make the protein that we ultimately will call a hormone. So overall nutrition, make sure you're getting enough calories, enough dietary protein, all of your vitamins, all of your minerals, making sure that you're not iron deficient or deficient in any other nutrient is going to be the first part of this first step. Now, the other thing is a lot of hormones have a rhythm to them. And the question also needs to be, are you making the correct amount of hormone at the correct time? So we could just use a really easy example of melatonin. If you have melatonin that's being produced in the middle of the day, that's not appropriate, right? You would get sleepy at a weird inopportune time. So there needs to be a rhythm. So similarly, thyroid hormone is a bit more active in the morning. You could think of the estrogen cycle throughout a woman's monthly cycle. Testosterone is highest in the morning and then dips down towards the evening. So you also wanna be mindful of the time of day and whether or not the rhythm of that hormone production is acting the way it should. Then there are other components like with thyroid hormone as an example, you can make thyroid hormone, T4, but then you need to convert it into a different molecule called T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. So it's like you're taking one thing and you're turning it into, or you're producing a second hormone from that building block. So do you have the cofactors? Do you have the things needed to make that conversion? And very oftentimes conversions happen either in the liver or the gut and surprise, surprise, they need their own sets of proteins and their own sets of cofactors. So with that conversion from T4 to T3, Amy and I have talked about this on the podcast quite a bit, but we have noted that in order to convert T4 to T3, you need adequate dietary carbohydrate intake and dietary selenium intake. So, you know, selenium is the low hanging fruit. I think a lot of people chase after that and they'll pop a Brazil nut every day. But if you're not getting enough carbohydrate, you might be tanking your T3 inadvertently and not really realizing it. So keep in mind that there's these interconversions between the hormones. And ultimately, for a lot of hormones that we think of, the production relies on another stimuli. So you don't just make thyroid hormone until you have the signal from TSH, which is made up in part of your nervous system, the pituitary. Similarly, your ovaries don't just make estrogen for the heck of it, they make estrogen because of signaling molecules from the pituitary. So you also need to be mindful of that within the realm of production. But that's, that's a general kind of overview of the production piece of this at the bare minimum. Okay, so let's assume that your body made the hormone in question, go you, but now what? 
there's three other pieces to the acronym, right? Well, if you made a hormone and then it just stayed in your gland and it didn't go anywhere, that wouldn't do you a heck of a lot of good, right? Like all of the cells of your body need these hormones, not just the gland itself. So if you made thyroid hormone and it just sat around in your thyroid all day, that wouldn't actually benefit you a tremendous amount. So the next step in this process is after you produce the hormone, you need to transport it around. You need to cart it around the bloodstream. And I know what you're thinking, maybe that this is overly, overly analyzing a simple process, but I assure you I'm not. Because hormones don't just free float willy nilly in the bloodstream. They're not just out there swimming around by themselves. They are attached to carrier proteins 99 point something percent of the time. So when we think about carrier protein function, that's ultimately what we're getting at and things in the bloodstream that could affect this process. So for example, if you are really inflamed or if you're dehydrated, both of those things are gonna make your blood much more viscous, much more thick, and it's gonna be much harder to carry around nutrients and hormones through your bloodstream. So making sure that you are adequately hydrated and treating inflammation if you are indeed inflamed become two really important things for hormone transportation. And then obviously, if it's carried around by a carrier protein, you could imagine that also protein is really, really important for this. So similarly, you're not gonna make the hormone if you don't have protein, but also you're not gonna carry it around in your bloodstream properly if you don't have dietary protein. So making sure that you're eating a balanced diet and you're getting adequate amounts and types of protein is very, very important for hormone, hormone function. And then last but not least, I will make mention that blood sugar regulation also can directly impact carrier hormone or carrier protein and hormone function. So making sure that you're not insulin resistant, making sure that you're not pre-diabetic or heaven forbid diabetic, or if you are on the other end of the spectrum, making sure that you don't let yourself crash and burn into hypoglycemic low blood sugar states. Blood sugar regulation is very, very important for the transportation of these hormones. And it's fundamentally important for the health of the rest of your body for that matter. So, all right, so now we have produced the hormone, we have transported it. Now, S stands for sensitivity. And what I mean by this really is receptor sensitivity. I'm gonna use a really easy example, and that is insulin resistance and prediabetes or diabetes, somewhere on that spectrum. And if you want more information about that, I actually just did a video not that long ago about the gut and hyperglycemia, high blood sugar connection. So go check that out next. But in the meantime, let's use that as a good example for the rest of the hormone conversation in regards to sensitivity. So you made the hormone, go you. You transport it around your body, also go you. And the hormone arrives at the cell, right? So like, let's draw us a cell. All right, here's the cell, here's the nucleus. And let's say H for hormone. Your hormone arrives at the cell and your cell wants to bring it in and it wants to use that hormone. Well, it has receptors either on the cell surface or on the nucleus itself that are going to allow the hormone to dock with it, pull it in, and then there's some sort of change that's gonna happen. Different DNA transcription, new proteins are made, something happens because this hormone was taken into the cell and utilized. Well, what about this? What about that receptor? Everything kind of hinges on that receptor, right? Right, so if we think about the case of hyperglycemia, high blood sugar and insulin resistance and prediabetes, what happens is that those people have not only adequate amounts of insulin, they maybe have too much insulin because they've been over consuming carbs and sugar or maybe not working out enough for a prolonged period of time. So you get higher levels of insulin or at the bare minimum, normal levels of insulin. And then we come over here to the cell and that poor cell has seen high blood sugar and high insulin for so long now that at some point the receptor says, no, nope, no, we are good, no thank you, Go to the next customer, please. No, we have enough magazines, leave me alone. So the sensitivity or the willingness for that receptor to utilize that hormone and take it in is very, very important. And this can tie in with a lot of things that we've already talked about. Things like inflammation, because guess what? Inflammatory signaling molecules, AKA cytokines, tend to block that receptor. 
So now your receptors just don't work as well, even if they want to. They don't have the ability to do so anymore. So we have things like receptors. In the case of thyroid hormone function, we want T3 to dock with that receptor. Well, what if you have a lot of reverse T3? Or as I call it, T3's evil twin cousin. What if you have a whole bunch of reverse T3 that's docking on that same receptor and taking up that parking spot? And now there's no room for real T3 to dock on and do its job. That would kind of suck, right? So inflammatory states, inflammatory cytokines, increased levels of things like reverse T3 in the case of the thyroid, and also lack of physical activity or just an overproduction, overstimulation of this pathway for a prolonged period of time can play a really, really big role in the sensitivity or lack thereof for the receptor. Now, the opposite is also true for a different reason. So we're talking about low receptor sensitivity and why that might be problematic for somebody who has symptoms of low functioning hormones like hypothyroidism. But we can turn this on, its, on, it, on the flippity flip, as Michael Scott would say, little brain fart. But if you think, what if the, sense, what if the receptor is overly sensitive? What if that receptor is going hog wild and is getting super stimulated from a minimal amount of hormone? Well, that can sometimes happen in states of estrogen dominance, and it can happen in states like endometriosis. And that estrogen receptor actually is very, very implicated in disease states, particularly around IBS. And that can lead to hyperactive immune responses, inflammation, and things like visceral hypersensitivity and pain and bloating and motility problems. So we can have this going both ways. We want our receptors to be just the right amount of sensitive. We don't want them to be less sensitive or more sensitive than our physiology needs. And working on our inflammatory levels and trying to treat inflammation in whatever way is appropriate for us and globally reducing that inflammatory burden so that these receptors can work the best they can is your best ticket to making sure that this doesn't get in your way. Last but not least, let's say you produce the hormone, yes. You transport the hormone, yes. And you have the perfect, mwah, correct amount of sensitivity at your receptor level. So that hormone comes in like a big warm hug, the cell is happy to have it, it utilizes it, and then what happens? Right, because something else needs to happen. Otherwise, your cells would just be accumulating more and more and more and more hormones until they burst and they were overflowing with hormones. That's not what happens though. So the last step in this process is going to be detoxification or excretion or some combination thereof. So your body needs to either deactivate the hormone and excrete it or otherwise detoxify it and get it out of the body so that it can either have a new life and be recycled or it could just go down the drain, so to speak. And a lot of this boils down to, not surprisingly, the liver and also the gut. Because remember what happens with the liver. Let me, let me grab my little eraser. Remember a little anatomy lesson, if you will. All right, here's your liver, approximately, and your gallbladder is hanging out underneath. The liver is going to be doing a lot of the detoxification for us. So detoxing environmental pollutants and compounds and toxins and yes, hormones. And it's going to put that into bile. And then the bile is going to be concentrated in the gallbladder. If you have one, if not, well, not so much. Then the bile is going to get dumped into, you guessed it, your intestines. And it's going to make it all the way through your intestines where either some of that hormone or some of that substance is going to be recycled and picked back up into circulation and brought back to the liver, or you're going to poop it out. So gut health ends up being very, very important for the sake of detoxification. This is particularly true with thyroid hormone and insulin, or I'm sorry, um, thyroid hormone and estrogen rather in a direct sense, because there are enzymes made by gut bacteria that can either recycle your estrogen and let it have a second life and keep going and going like the Energizer Bunny, which sounds lovely, but it's not so lovely if somebody has too much estrogen or too much estrogenic activity to begin with, which is the case for women with endometriosis and things like estrogen dominance. 
So in, in this case, recycling seems cool until you have too much of the thing you're recycling and then you just want to get rid of it. So too much recycling could be a bad thing, but also thyroid hormone. Remember back to what I mentioned about T3 blocking that thyroid receptor? A lot of T3 is made in the gut and it's done so under an inflammatory state. So we want to keep our gut microbiome healthy. And I know I'm preaching to the choir at this point because you guys have watched my videos by now, but you need to feed your good bacteria. You want to inhibit bad bacteria on an as need be basis and trim back anything that's pathogenic or overgrown or causing problems. And you wanna make sure that the pH of your colon and the pH of your stool is nice and low, nice and acidic, because a nice low pH in the colon inhibits those nasty enzymes that are made by the bacteria that would ultimately recycle too much estrogen for you. So gut health is tremendously important in this case. Things like motility, if you have pooping problems and you're constantly constipated, guess what? You're gonna be reabsorbing a lot more of this junk from your GI system just because there's that much more time that the stool is in contact with the epithelial barrier and it's allowing for more absorption of nasty stuff. So you wanna treat motility or constipation if you have issues with that. If you have any sort of like bile acid malabsorption issue, you want to work on that. And liver health, just broadly. And again, the liver is going to need proper nutrition, adequate amounts of the three macros, protein, fat, and carbohydrates, and adequate levels of vitamins and minerals, particularly the B vitamins, but really all of them are fair game. Your liver needs all of your nutrients. And ultimately, if you wanna go a step above and beyond, this applies to the sensitivity uh, conversation as well as the detoxification question. You need to get the toxic crap out of your life Stop slathering your body with phthalates and parabens and drinking out of BPA water bottles. You've got to get some of the toxic crap out of your system and out of your life in order to free up your liver to do other jobs for you, in order to take that burden off of your receptors and allow your receptors to work properly. That's a whole other topic for another video. I'm planning on doing a video about that sometime, I think, in November or December, by the way. But that is also very important when we talk about detoxification. And there you have it, folks. Hormone balancing doesn't actually have to be that complicated when you get down to it. Just follow this acronym, when in doubt, PTSD, and I think that you'll find your path towards hormonal wellness and happiness. If you guys want more information, there's actually a little bit more granular detail that I didn't go into in today's video. So I made a download down in the link below in the description, and I'll put it in the first comment. But if you go there, you can download a PDF where it just outlines this in more detail. For those visual learners, that might be more helpful. And I made a special page on there about hypothyroidism and estrogen dominance. Since those were recurring themes in today's video, I felt that they deserve their own sheet on that download. So go ahead down to the download link down below. You could have that and then frolic off into the rainbows with happy, healthy hormones, or at least that's my hope. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for tuning in and keep learning, keep healing, and I'll see you soon. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.